This morning we'll start at the cross. Matthew 27, 33. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he desires him, for he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this small man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. If the gospel had ended there, it would be a sad Sad day for us today. There would only be death, a hopeless end to our existence. And we could have called this fiction because it would present a God who forsakes those he loves to suffer. If Christ's life ended at the cross, he would have been just a man or just a teacher, which is what the bystanders thought because they were misinterpreting his cry out to God for a cry to Elijah. I mean, after all, why would anybody follow an abandoned Messiah who had abandoned us? Nobody really would, and these words are empty without the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Thankfully, the gospel does not end at the cross. We know what happens next, and that's because we have the context. Context is powerful. Many ignored the context of what Jesus taught and they misinterpreted what he spoke along with his actions. Many still do today, even those who follow him, even believers. Back then they could not understand how the king that they were promised would choose, willingly choose, suffering and death instead of conquering all of their enemies. They misinterpreted his humility and his suffering for weakness and for abandonment from God. 
Now, we also can and, and often do misinterpret our own suffering in life as if it is abandonment from God. And we do that when we fail to view our suffering and our pain in light of the entire context of Scripture, the whole counsel of God. After all, this stuff, this can be hard to believe when tragedy strikes your life, when you're in incredible pain. Tragedy and pain also struck Jesus. Tremendously, when he, he is in his darkest hour, suffering, bleeding, in excruciating pain. No one to help him. Because humans abandoned him. No one tried to rescue him. His own disciples fled. The Roman Empire, they're not going to save him. They have to save face. They need power. The religious teachers, the ones who should have known the best, misinterpreted his words and actions because Jesus did not fit in their Messiah box. So they chose to murder him in the place of a, of a, a real murderer. Even the criminals next to him reviled him. In, in Matthew's account, it's creation rejected, rejecting the creator. Creation rejecting the creator. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And in that desperation, abandoned by all humanity, it felt like at that point, he cries this out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, Jesus, God made flesh, forsaken by God. And this presents a tremendous theological dilemma for us. Now, some will call it a mystery. Some will say, well, he carried all of our sins, so because he had our sins on him, God could not look at him or touch him or even be near him. Yes, God is holy, of course, but it's more of a Greek philosophy to think that to God, sin is somehow kryptonite and he has to run away from it every time he sees it. God can go wherever he wants. He's God. The same God who allowed Satan into his throne room In Job is the same God who allows sinners like you and me into his presence because he is greater than sin and he is greater than evil. If God had to abandon us or humanity every time he came near sin, Jesus couldn't have touched anyone. Unless he was only human, but not divine. So the argument falls short. Of course, he never sinned, but he surely walked uh, amongst it. There's a difference between knowing sin and being near it. So nowhere in scripture do we see evidence of God completely separating himself from his own son. But we do have this cry and this wondering what he must have felt. That's what we do have. The physical pain, the emotional pain, a, a spiritual anguish we can't even put into words. So there would be a mystery for us because we can't fathom it. And then beside that wondering, what we do have is the biblical context. Now our, our church, and, and, and if you're a guest here, welcome. But those attending this church, we've been following Jesus since Christmas. Yeah, Christmas. 
through the book of Matthew, which is the most Jewish of all the Gospels. Written uh, mainly to Jewish Christians and, and Jews by Matthew and Jews. So the, there are more Old Testament uh, allusions and references in Matthew than any other of the Gospels. And from that Jewish lens, we would know that rabbis memorize scripture. I, I, don't know, I don't know about today, I'm sure they do, but I, especially back then. Rabbis memorize much of the Torah, a lot of the Psalms. So what Jesus spoke before his last, last breath was actually what a Jewish king wrote 1,000 years before the cross. Jesus, son of David, was quoting King David. And I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus Christ never quotes scripture out of context without knowing the end or what it truly meant. So the cry of desperation, it's actually, what it actually is, is a song written by David for a choir. I'll read the first few verses in Psalm 22. To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. The thought of doe of the dawn is, is the feeling of, of, of a, a deer being hunted early in the morning. David writes, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, in you they trusted and we're not put to shame. And it's a long psalm. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But if you go back, and it goes back and forth from this despair to crying out to proclamations declaring who God is and, and, and the promises of God. And then it, 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 it levels up and levels out right in the end on the positive, which we'll get to. But almost every line of this psalm is undeniable messianic prophecy of what Christ would go through at the cross. From the mocking him and the wagging their heads, even the garments being divided. There's so much here. Uh, uh, some branches of Christianity call it the fifth gospel. And there's been volumes of scholarly books written on it. But the climax really begins with the answer to the question of verse one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Really the answer to the reality of God forsaking those he loved. Of forsaking Jesus, it's verse 24. Here's what it says. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. You see, Jesus, Jesus obviously knew how this psalm ended. It was in his mind. So we don't know, I mean, even the word in the Greek for cry, it, it simply means intense or loud. Not necessarily weeping, although I'm sure. Whether it was a groan from his flesh from the pain or whether there was a, a, maybe a, a, a tune in that because he knows where it's going. It, what it was in the flesh doesn't matter. It was still a song in his spirit because in desperation, Jesus Christ never stopped trusting the Father, ever. His faith, his assurance was perfect even while he's crying out in desperation on the cross. And that's because he knows, he knew that his death is going to lead to the resurrection. And that's where we pick up in Matthew 28 this morning. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven 
and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you until the end of the age. What felt like abandonment, what felt like being forsaken, turned into victory. That is what Jesus was preaching all along. That's what he's, in Matthew, we've been following him. We're trying to get his disciples to see. Even while crying out in his pain and despair, in his spirit, for sure he was singing a song of hope. And so, so I began to study the other psalms that are quoted in the other gospels. That anything connected with his last moments. You have Psalm 69, Psalm 31, besides Psalm 32. And, and every single one has a structure that's common. It starts out with this desperate cry, be it save me or why have you forsaken me? And every single one of them ends in solid assurance and faith in God. Every single one ends in praise. The power of context changes everything. In his, in the, in his death and resurrection, Jesus has given us the answer. And his answer is the word. It has all the... Uh, Things that we wonder about in our pain and suffering. The word became flesh to answer our cries. And according to that word, God does answer the cries of our hearts that are in desperation. It's the cry of a, a mother losing her child. The cry of a child losing their mother. Cries wept from the traumatized and afflicted. Desperate cries of those betrayed by their own friends and those that they loved. The horrors of disease, the sting of death, the separation it brings in the physical. All of it, all, every single one are the results of sin and they still continue to produce. And Jesus bore all of that. All of it. He did it both in desperation and faith. Desperation and faith. Because he never stopped trusting. He never lost hope, even when he felt the burden. So the end of Psalm 22, it proclaims, it proclaims our salvation today and in the future. Through those cries of suffering and faith, salvation will come to generations knowing the Easter song. Psalm twenty-two twenty-seven 27 says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, 
and all the families of the nations shall bow down and worship before you. For the kingship and the kingdom are the Lord's. And he is the ruler over the nations. All the mighty ones upon the earth shall eat in thanksgiving and worship. And they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. Posterity, generations shall, ser shall serve him. They shall tell of the Lord to the next generation. There's the mission. Verse 31, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born that he has done it. It is finished. This psalm, it's a picture of what biblical faith really is. This is what biblical faith is. Whether you've been in the faith a while or you're thinking about, like, I'm thinking about this Christian faith. Let's see how this Easter service goes. And, you know, this is, this is what biblical faith is. In a day when many preach, many will preach that your faith is weak if you somehow express, I feel like God has abandoned me. <laughs> or I'm, I'm desperate right now. God is nowhere to be found. Faith in God, trusting God, is not a facade that we wear like a mask to hide what we are really going through. That's not biblical faith. Faith is being vulnerable and open to God, telling Him how you feel. Yes, even asking Him why. Matthew 7, 7 Think of asking in that context, why, Lord? We often think of it as, Lord, when, you know, when can I have this or when is this going to happen? But, but, but the greatest asking that is, is given an answer is the ones we cry out from the depths of a vulnerable heart that's open before the Father because he's going to answer with victory in the end. That's biblical faith. And we can do that while still trusting in who he is and what he has done. Psalm 22 is an Easter song, really, that Jesus began at the cross and continued because it turned into the message that we are boldly proclaiming by his spirit this morning and with our lives, that we serve a living God to a desperate world that is dying who does not abandon his children to despair ever. He does not do that. He allows suffering, but he brings a comfort. He allows loneliness with the intent that we're going to draw near to him because of it. And we may feel like he left, but his promises. They don't go anywhere. They remain. From the old to the new, the promise is this. For, for those who trust in him, those who turn to him, it's in Deuteronomy. It's in Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you or forsake you. And in Christ, never means never, no matter what it feels like. In fact, death isn't even the end. Funerals, yeah, funerals, they're hard, I know. They're not as hard for the believer. Um, th that's from, from my opinion, that doing funerals. It's still difficult, mind you, because death isn't the end. The Bible actually says that it's, a, it's but a shadow. Death is but a shadow. Shadows disappear when light invades and permeates and blasts them away. And it's no accident. I don't think this is just, we're, you know, we're just going to throw these psalms together in some random order, right? Even with, I know, of course, we're in chapter and verse numbers in the, in the original manuscripts, but it, it, it's, it's right here. I, I find it interesting that Psalm 23 comes right after Psalm 22.
Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know what? Jesus knew that one too. He knew it by heart. His parents might have sang it to him when he was little. We don't know. The gospel doesn't end in the shadow of death. It inaugurated in the kingdom of life. The Bible doesn't even end with darkness covering the face of the earth. In Genesis 1-2, it ends with uh, revela- uh, everlasting light uh, and light in Revelation, Re- Revelation 22-5. It doesn't end in darkness. And this is proven in in the birth and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you know the Father through Christ, that's the only way. There is no other way. By His Spirit, you have an end in sight. So you may feel desperation this morning. You know, I would actually hope that's why Easter services are so filled. Yeah, it's great believers we're getting together and and professing the resurrection of our Lord, but my, my greater hope is that they're filled with desperate people who need an answer. They had trouble even waking up this morning, getting out of bed because of the circumstances in their life. It's okay to cry out and be desperate. It's okay to cry out and be desperate and say, I need help to a God who loves you. Because when you're crying out to the shepherd, which is the psalm, what Psalm 23 is all about, he's the one who leads you out of the valley. Who instead of saying this, instead of saying, well, where's your God now? Jesus says this, Behold, I am with you to the end of the age. You have to learn. You have to learn what Jesus was singing in his spirit, the Easter song, because it always ends in victory. So we follow him to the cross, and yeah, we have to carry our cross, but that's not it. We're also following him to the resurrection. So we do not stay in Psalm 22, verse 1, because following Jesus always leads to Psalm 23, 6. And it says this, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the whole story. That's the whole context. So you can't misinterpret your circumstances this morning that you're in right now, whatever they are, as if God has forsaken you. He hasn't. Humans forsook him at the cross, not God. After the resurrection, they continued to follow him even to their own deaths. That's how powerful it was. Before that, eh, not so much. They weren't sure. They knew now that the end, the disciples knew that the end was greater and the victory was assured. I mean, after all, he rose from the dead. So the disciples knew the end of that that psalm, surely. But today, today in our day, in 2024, many are falling away like the disciples did, which is troubling. It's troubling because of where we stand on the other side of the resurrection. And that's because we have this tendency to take things out of context. Of course, in the scripture, that's like cherry picking a verse just to make it suit whatever you like to believe, but just life in general, it's the same old mistakes. The Pharisees did it, the the Romans did it, those kingdoms that were battling against the, the kingdom of God, Satan, Love to take things out of context, still does. His own disciples. But if you let your circumstances interpret your level of hope, 
when his, his resurrection has already interpreted that, interpreted that for us. It's interpreted our circumstances. It's interpreted what you're going through this morning. If you've been misinterpreting, there's grace. There's amazing grace for us still. Despite our failures, just as his followers back at the cross to follow him and flee away when things aren't working out or when suffering increases or we have this threat coming into our lives and we panic and we dread. That's, that's where grace comes in. The last prayer of the Bible. By his grace, the grace that's left with us, that's the prayer. And that's what we have today. We can be saved. We can be saved. We can follow him as Lord. That means master. That means just not, of course, the savior thing, but the Lord too, right? That we're following him every day. Despite our, despite our heartache, despite what you're going through, And praise him out of it. So there's a song in our cries too. He's not far from me this morning. He's here. His spirit is here. He's risen, yes. But his spirit is here. And that spirit is the, the, the thing that teaches us how to do this. It teaches us this new song. Romans 8, 9 says, Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And there it is. A dying body, yet life in the spirit. It sounds, sounds tense. My body is dying, but I have this awesome life. Yeah, it is. It, it is tense. It's awesome. Because even though our bodies are dying and we suffer great pain, like Jesus, we have life in his spirit. And today, you can have life in his spirit, in his name, in Jesus' name. And that's the only way you're going to get through what you're going through because I'll be honest you can't get through what you're going through I can't you can't none of us can we never could he knew that we needed help he knew we were a desperate people who were hurting and broken and he came and he was hurt and broken for us it's a life lived open before the father and each other in a, in a, in a body in a community what the church is supposed to be all about not hiding and not hiding as if we got it all under control and all figured out, but desperately crying out to the God who still saves. And he proved what he does at the cross and through the resurrection. Would you close your eyes this morning? Same spirit. The same spirit. What? No matter what you feel, the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead on that first resurrection day. A day filled of, full of fear and joy at the same time. Power. That Holy Spirit this morning is the one calling you, not the tone of my voice or the arrangements that is spontaneously coming out of my preacher's mouth because I have to be led by the Spirit in this. This morning, He's calling you. He's calling you to a life that may involve desperation. I'm sorry, it will involve desperation and suffering and pain, but at the same time, it's gonna, it's gonna be full of hope and joy and strength to walk through it and overcome no matter what happens in your life. You can still trust in him because you know the end of the story. You know the end of the, the song, 
Like I think of that song, this is my story, this is my song. That's it. Because I, I'm going to praise Jesus. This morning, if, if that's you, I'm not even asking for signs from you physically. But you just simply begin to cry out in desperation from the depths of your heart inside. You can pray out loud if you want to. But some of you here have come desperate. You've come, you've come calloused in your heart. You've grown cold to Christianity. The church has wounded you. Jesus was wounded for those wounds too. And he will bring healing. And he will help you overcome that. This morning, just your sinner's prayer, your, your profession of faith is within your heart, in the spirit that's leading you to draw closer to him. He wants your dedication. He wants your commitment to walk through whatever storm comes your way based on what he's already done for us at the cross and in his resurrection. Father, this morning I pray by your spirit, Lord, that we would learn to sing your song in the midst of despair, in the midst of tragedy, Lord, that we would overcome, that we would see that you've promised us uh, death to ourselves, yes, Lord, but resurrection life. We have death in the physical, but we are eternal spiritually forever with him. That's where he wants you. From the beginning to the end, he just wants you. He desires you. And you have to step out and turn to him this morning. It's not really a guided meditation. It's a spirit thing. This morning, open yourself up and be vulnerable and cry out to the Father who will never abandon you and you will not be disappointed. So Lord, I thank you for the decisions this morning. Lord, you see our hearts. You know the depths. Lord, I pray for relief from the tension, God. And that relief would lead to your spirit that we would learn to trust and know you more in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that we would keep at the center what you've done for us, Lord, who you are especially, the God who never, ever forsakes his own. And Lord, that you would pour out your spirit in this place and bring new life to these, your people. Lord, bless us as we leave here today. But we're already blessed because of you. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are uh, in despair this morning, you're troubled, you've made some kind of decision, or you just need prayer, we're going to have a few from our prayer team up here as you leave here and continue about your day. So feel free to come out, come on up and get prayer.